Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Dana Trubiana and I cover infamous gangsters every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, is released every Tuesday morning. So now we are officially on part five of Angelo Leonardo. What a long way we've come, right? <laughs> Honestly, going into this episode, I have no idea if this is going to be the last episode of the series but if it isn't, there's only going to be one more episode after it. The only reason that I even say there may be one more part is because I know that there's going to be a lot of information on Big Ange's actual trial and what led up to him flipping and everything. And I kind of tend to take forever to get any kind of story out. So, you know, here we are, part five. Don't even know if that's going to be the last part, but there's only going to be five or six. So definitely not no seven. <laughs> As much as I've really liked going through this and doing such a deep, in-depth analysis on Big Inch, I am ready to move on to a new gangster myself. I really hope that you guys don't feel that way and you're still enjoying the episodes about Big Ange, and I'm definitely still enjoying making them. I'm just used to learning about a new person every week, and that hasn't been the case recently, so I'm just eager to finish this one up and get all the information into one or two more episodes. Okay, so where were we? We've gotten to the point where Big Ange is now officially the underboss of the Cleveland crime family after Likavali took the position of boss of the family. Mosseri was killed at the Feast of Assumption by John Nardi, and Mosseri was Likavali's original underboss. So when he died, Big Ange Leonardo stepped in and became the new underboss of the Cleveland family. In 1978 and 1979, Rockman and Big Ange took a road trip to Chicago. While they were there, Angelo says that he saw Rockman grab Cleveland's cut from Anthony Chiavola. And this was such a significant amount of money that in 1979, Licavalli and Angelo also went on this trip, which is a big deal because Licavalli is the boss of the family. So if he's making a trip, it's definitely for a significant amount of money. Angelo says that the skimming shenanigans, they're going on for a long time. They didn't stop until at least 1984, to the point where it was still going on even after Angelo was arrested and in jail. In 1983, Rockman swung by Angelo's prison cell and let him know that he was on his way to Missouri to grab even more skim money from Vegas. Even in 1984, Ballestieri confirmed that the skim was still full swing. Since the 1920s, the Cleveland family has been really tight with the Genovese family in New York City. They go way back, and that's why the Genovese family are the ones that are representing Cleveland on the commission. And they also have a lot of other families that they're representing, like Magadino and the Pittsburgh family. I don't know if you guys remember, we talked about it in like the first or the second episode, but let's refresh real quick. The Cleveland family lost their seat on the commission, which had been obtained in the first place when Frank Milano went to Manhattan. He ended up sitting down with the bosses and he got a seat on the commission as well as a spot in the National Crime Syndicate. And that spot on the commission and spot in the National Crime Syndicate had been held all the way up until John Scalish died. John Scalish was the boss of the Cleveland crew for 30 years. But when he died, he hadn't named an official successor. Rockman, Big Ange's brother-in-law, remember, he married the sister of Mary Scalish, Big Ange's wife. So Rockman was with John Scalish the day that he died. And Rockman claims that John's dying wish was for Licavalli to succeed him as boss of the family. While Big Ange swears that John Scalish couldn't and wouldn't have actually said this, he says like he would have named Ange himself and Rockman only wanted Licavalli as the boss of the family because Rockman felt that Licavalli was a lot easier for him to control. But since Rockman was the only one there when John Scalish died, there's nobody else there to corroborate the story. So because of that, Licavalli is now the new boss of the family. Well, that may have been what Scalish wanted or 
Rockman, I guess. But that is not what Licavalli wanted. Licavalli said no. So for the time being, the Cleveland family didn't have a boss. War broke out on the streets of Cleveland, vying for the top spot in the family. Younger members that wanted the position of boss of the family went to war, and there was bodies dropping everywhere. To top it off, the Cleveland family also went to war with Danny Green at the same time. So bodies are dropping left and right from both clashes going on with the Cleveland family. This put a huge amount of heat on these guys. There was headline-grabbing news coming out of the Cleveland family every single day. Every day, there's reporting going on about the mafia and the mafia wars that are happening on the streets. It's all over the newspapers. It's all over the news in the morning. The city was given the moniker Bomb City because of how many people were dying in car bombs, bombs on their houses, bombs and limbs everywhere, all over the place in Cleveland. Now, because of this mess going on in Cleveland, the five families wanted to put as much distance as possible between themselves and Cleveland. And because of that, the seat that Cleveland had been holding for such a long time on the commission was revoked. They would still be represented on the commission, but they would now be represented through Tony Salerno, a higher up in the Genovese family. So now, because they lost their seat, The Genovese family is their go-to for commission matters. Leonardo made the trip to New York a few times a year to hash out family business. In 1976, Licavalli and Angelo again swung by to show some respect to Tony Salerno and inform him that Leonardo was the new underboss of the Cleveland family. In that same year, after Mosseri got whacked, they headed to the Big Apple to talk to Salerno about taking care of some more business. Namely, dealing with Danny Green and John Nardi. They hoped that Salerno could arrange something with Paul Castellano in New York. The thought process was that Castellano and Salerno could take out Nardi and Green when they made their next trip to New York so that the Cleveland family could be as far away from it as possible. Long story short, Nardi and Green never made that second trip. They didn't live long enough. So the New York help never materialized, and it wasn't really on the part of New York. It just never was needed. But they were willing and able to do it if they were called upon. During their trip to New York in 1977, they asked permission to make 10 fresh faces into the Cleveland family. Salerno, of course, gives them the green light, and he even threw in there that if they needed more, they could let him know, and he would allow that. That would be okay. So this is a huge moment for the Cleveland family. I was telling you guys earlier that the Cleveland family had started to dwindle because of so many years under the oppressive reign of previous bosses. They hadn't been making any new members since way before New York City officially closed the books for 20 years. And they hadn't started again. The timing of this trip was no coincidence. They made the trip in 1977 to ask for permission to make new people, because they had been told, just as everybody else in the Mafia had always been told, no new guys would be able to be made until Carlo Gambino died. Gambino died on October 15th, 1976, and Cleveland made the trip in 1977, and they got the green light. Now, whenever they needed to get in touch with Salerno, they had their guy, John Peanuts Tronalone. Tronalone is really tight with Salerno and the Genovese crew, and he's the consigliere, in the Cleveland family, while Angelo is still rocking the underboss title. Remember, Big Ange picked up the position of underboss of the family after Motri had been killed by John Nardi. Nardi had Motri killed on August 22, 1976, and Nardi was killed on May 17, 1977, only nine months after Motri. It doesn't really surprise me that Nardi was killed, honestly. One of the main reasons that Motri had beef with Nardi was because of the close relationship that Nardi had with Danny Green. Yes, the same Danny Green that the Cleveland family had just been at war with, gaining Cleveland the moniker of Bomb City. So Nardi is not a member of the Cleveland family, but Motri is. Again, he was the underboss. Nardi has a beef with Motri for many reasons, but the final blow came during a meeting at the Feast of Assumption, where Nardi claimed that the Cleveland family, and I guess Motri, just because that's who he was talking to, 
I don't know. But he claims that the Cleveland family owes him money. They owe him a cut of the illegal gambling profits that the family was seeing from the feast. And Mochery pretty much laughs at him. This all goes down in public. And it's pretty much just a back and forth, them saying nasty, vile stuff to each other. They're threatening each other. They're cursing each other out. They're just saying the meanest thing that comes to mind. And it's very public. Everybody sees this happen. Mochery tells him that he can go pluck himself. And they go back and forth just, you know, threatening, cursing each other out the way it just goes down. At the end of the feast, Nardi ends up killing Motri. Well, that's what we assume. It's the last place that Motri was ever seen, but they never ended up finding a body. So who knows where or when he was actually killed. To this day, there is still not a body. The only evidence that he was killed came from his car. Motri's Benz was found 10 days after he went missing with the trunk covered in blood. So clearly they took him out. They threw his body in the trunk and then they ended up disposing of his body and abandoning the car. So they never found the body, but they knew that he was dead. After killing Mochery, Nardi makes a preemptive move. He knows that the family is going to come after him for killing Mochery. This is the underboss of the Cleveland family. Of course they're going to come after him. So what does Nardi do? He grabs his buddy Danny Green, and the two of them go after Eugene the Animal Chiasolo. He is the family hitman. So it only makes sense that this is the guy who they're going to send to come after him. So instead of sitting around and waiting for the Cleveland family to make the first move and send their hitman to kill him, he decides he's going to go after the hitman himself. Nardi and Green place a bomb on the front porch, Philip Testa style. Yeah, that's a name that you guys haven't heard come out of my mouth in a really long time, huh? Go watch the video I made about Nikki Scarfo if you want to hear about the whole story. But yeah, Chi Solo, he gets a bomb under his porch the same way that Testa did. Testa died, but Chi Solo did not. He was really badly hurt, but he did live through the explosion. This is now two very important people in the Cleveland family that Nardi had personally killed. In Chia Solo's case, he tried to kill him, but either way, you catch my drift. The intent was to kill. So obviously, what do you think is going to happen? The Cleveland family throws all of their infighting out the window. We don't care at all about the fighting that's going on, about who's going to be boss. Like, this no longer matters We are going to unite and we are going to have one singular purpose. Take out Nardi. Butchie's sister Nino and Ali Calabrese decided that this was their moment to shine. It was their sole focus in life to take this man down. They went after Nardi while he was hanging out in Little Italy, but they missed him. And that's a pretty big thing to say. Because if Nardi is just hanging out in Little Italy, he's not really that scared of these guys. He knows that the Cleveland family is coming for him, and he's just lounging around walking down the street in Little Italy, where most people would be smart enough to hit the mattresses and stay low to not get killed. But he just gives no fucks. So he's out there chilling, and they go after him, and they miss. A few days later, Nardi is once again strolling down the street in Little Italy, and once again... Sister Nino and Calabrese go after him with a shotgun. This time, they're in a moving car, and he's walking on foot. So they're just, like, driving. They see him walking down the street, and they try to shoot him from the moving car. Obviously, this is not the best conditions for accuracy, and he was easily able to avoid this attempt on his life. But the message was loud and clear. We are coming for you. So then Nardi turns around and he's like, all right, listen, listen, I was willing to look past the first two murder attempts because you know what? I did kill two of your people. I did. I give you that. I may have deserved the first attempt, but the second attempt was just blatant disrespect. I'm getting tired of it and I'm not having any more of it. Anybody that takes a shot at me from this point forward is going down. You're dead. I am not playing around anymore. I'm not dodging bullets anymore. I'm not worrying about my personal safety. I am shooting back. Anyone that comes after me is dead. And you know what? I'll take it a step further. Not only is the person with the gun in their hand going to die, but I'm going to also kill the person that's responsible for that person. Oh, someone higher up ordered a hit on me? They're dead too. 
I will wipe out this whole family if I have to. Try me, baby. Call my bluff. And remember, this beef between Nardi and the Cleveland family, it's very public. Nardi went and did an interview with a news reporter. The reporter reached out to him to ask him about his beef that he had with Likavali. And Nardi said that he had been lifelong friends with Likavali. They were not fighting. There's no bad blood. Everybody who hears or thinks that is wrong. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And he and Likavali, they're besties. There's no bad blood. Why would there be bad blood? We love each other. In that same interview, he does confirm that he's friends with Danny Green, but also says that he doesn't work for him, he doesn't work with him, they don't work together, they're just friends. On May 17th, 1977, Nardi left work. He got into his car in the parking lot of Teamsters Joint Council 41. There was a bomb on the ground next to the car. They knew better than to try to put the bomb in the car itself. And the explosion was so powerful that it took off Nardi's legs. The book To Kill an Irishman says that as Nardi was being pulled away from the car, he whispered, it didn't hurt. People around him interpreted this as his final act of defiance, but most likely it was just adrenaline. Like this man didn't feel anything because he was dying. He was dead before police vehicles had a chance to arrive at the scene. As opposed to the movie To Kill the Irishman, where Danny Green wept as he held his dying friend in his arms, Green was nowhere to be found. He wasn't there. That was just for, like, Hollywood cinematic drama. Nardi died in that parking lot completely alone. Okay, so back to the issue at hand. Salerno had condemned Johnny Keys Simone and other men to the chopping block because of an unsanctioned offing of Angelo Bruno, the Philly boss. And this is so crazy because I swear on my life that I didn't mean to do that, but it's so funny. I mentioned Philip Testa because the way that they tried to off that guy reminded me of Testa's murder. And in the next breath, we're talking about the Philly mob again. It's like a total coinky dink. It's, it's funny, but that wasn't supposed to happen. So let's stop and talk about that for a minute. What happened that had so many guys' heads on the chopping block? Angelo Bruno was killed by his consigliere, Antonio Caponegro, on March 21st, 1980. Salerno is sitting there and he's scratching his head because he's like, wait, what the hell just happened? Nobody asked permission. Permission was never given. It is absolutely unacceptable that a boss was just killed. It is never okay to kill a boss, period. Antonio Tony Bananas Caponegro's body was found one month after Bruno's death on April 18, 1980. Police state that he had been tortured, beaten, strangled, repeatedly stabbed, and shot. According to police, around $300 in $20 bills were found stuffed in various parts of his body. So I guess the message was that he killed Bruno to get rich, and they would give him money since he wanted it so bad. The body was found in the trunk of a car in the Bronx, naked and just absolutely destroyed. This boy was in bad shape. And they weren't just done with this after torturing this dude to death. Everybody that conspired with him is going down too. The first name on the list of conspirators? Johnny Keys, Bruno's cousin. Bruno's murder kicked off a war, and by the end of it, over 20 mobsters would be taken out over the course of the next four years. Another mobster to die was Alfred Joe Salerno, no relation to Tony, but he was the brother-in-law to Capo Negro. His body was found the same day that Capo Negro's was. He wasn't tortured as badly as Capo Negro. Capo Negro definitely got the worst of it, but they definitely threw him a beating. Most of the bones in his face were broken, and he was shot four times. Three times behind the right ear, and one time behind the left. So I'm guessing that means two shooters. They're lucky they didn't catch crossfire. Like, that could have ended really badly for the shooter, but... John DeGilio pulled off both of those murders, and he ended up being killed in May of 1988. Angelo Prisco was found guilty of his murder, and it was ruled that the murder was ordered by Vincent the Chin Gigante. 
Phil Testa and Salvatore Testa were killed in the battle that took place after Bruno's death for that top spot, and that left Nikki Scarfo as the boss of Philadelphia. That story has its own episode because it's a crazy one. I did an episode on Nikki Scarfo. That's a wild one. Now, it's not that crazy to hear everything that's going on because there was an unsanctioned hit of a boss. Like, people hear about the mafia and they think that killing a boss is no big deal because they hear about the death of Paul Castellano and Carmine Galante, these bosses that were killed, Anastasia. And it always comes out like, oh, there was no permission. There was permission. It is a big deal to take out a boss. So you hear that this dude gets tortured and all these people die afterwards. It's not that crazy because... A boss of a family died. This is a big deal. But it comes out years later that they didn't have the full story. All these people ended up falling for this. They all ended up dying. But it comes out years later that it was actually Vincent the Chin Gigante that had ordered Bruno's murder. It turns out that the mix-up happened thanks to Frank Funzi Thierry. Capo Negro had actually done everything right. He went to New York, he kissed the ring, and he asked for permission from the head of the Genovese family, Thierry, to off Bruno. Thierry gave him the go-ahead, and then he turned around and denied it. Apparently, he had beef with Capo Negro over a business deal that had gone wrong, and him lying and saying that he had gotten permission from the other bosses was his way to get back at Capo Negro, knowing that if he told Capo Negro that he had permission to do it, and then he did it, he would be killed for offing a boss. Honestly, I'm blown away at how messed up this is. I did the research backwards. I knew that Capo Negro died because of an unsanctioned hit on Bruno. But the fact that he did all the right things, went to ask for permission, in his eyes, got permission from the commission. And not only to die for it, not only to get brutally tortured to death for it, not only did his brother-in-law die for it, but a shit ton more people die, all for this hit that stems from Frank Thierry just being a comic book villain. Like, what a beast. And that's not said in, like, the good way that I usually say it. Like, when I say someone's a beast, I'm usually saying a good thing. This guy is, like, a monster. And he's just sitting there like, ha ha ha, I got Capo Negro to off Bruno and tortured to death. All because of a business deal gone wrong. Like, what a monster. So anyways, now this hit goes through, and Keys is involved. But Keys didn't think he was doing anything wrong. None of these guys thought that they were doing anything wrong, thanks to Frank Thierry. But then... Capo Negro goes missing, and his body turns up tortured to death. So now that's a little bit of an indication that something is wrong, they did something wrong, and he has something to worry about. So Keyes goes to Tronalone, who, remember, is the consigliere of the Cleveland crime family and is also really tight with Salerno. Keyes, he's not just some Joe Schmo. Word on the street is that Keyes has 50 hits under his belt. This boy has put work in for the family. So Tron alone turns around and he's like, all right, I got you. I will help you figure this out. What's going to happen is you're going to pay for me to take a trip to New York. I'll go to New York. I'll talk to Salerno and anyone else that needs to be talked to and we'll get it all worked out. Tron alone goes to New York and he comes back to Keys and he's like, all right, I got everything figured out. Don't worry. You are squared away. Everything is fine. I talked to Salerno. He's good with you, but he does want to meet you in person. Keys goes to New York, and the next thing you know, Keys is found whacked in New York. Trone alone, ever the bragger, says that he took care of that thing. Now, this murder is one of 19 that Sammy the Bull Gravano openly admits to taking part in. Gravano did an interview with Vlad TV where he talks about this specific murder. He says that he was handed the contract, he met with Keys two times, and he killed him on the third meeting. He says that he had a lot of guys there to help him with it. Miloto, D'Angelo, and a few more guys. This group of guys kidnapped Keys from a golf club in Pennsylvania and took him to Staten Island. Vlad states, and Gravano agrees, that Keys had some requests before he died. First, he wanted a made man to kill him Cosa Nostra style. Next, he wanted Gravano to take his shoes off. Not Gravano. He wanted Gravano to take 
Keyes's shoes off. Keyes asked Gravano, can you take my shoes off? In the past, he had calmed his wife down because his wife knew that they were at war and he had calmed her down by telling her that he was going to die with his shoes off. In other words, hanging out around the house, laying on the sofa, some way at the house, he was going to die with his shoes off. So now that he knew that his time had come, he wanted to send a message to his wife to let her know that he was thinking about her before she died, which is just so sweet and heartbreaking. And it's so sad that all these deaths happen because Frank Thierry is a piece of shit. Now, if you're listening to this video, I'm kind of assuming that you are into mafia history. As much as I would love to tout myself as how amazing I am, and that just about anybody would watch my videos. I don't kid myself into believing that. I know most people hear me say that I'm about to talk about a mobster and they click right off my video. They have absolutely no interest. So I kind of assume that this is an interest of yours. If this is an interest of yours, I assume that you've done a little bit of watching of Sammy the Bull Gravano's YouTube videos. And he's an amazing storyteller. The shit that he talks about is insane. And the way that he tells stories is excellent. I stopped watching him after he said some shit that just pissed me off to the point that I could never watch him again. But I will not deny the fact that, one, he is one of the most open people out there. Like, he will talk about anything. He talks about shit that you could not torture out of me. <laughs> and two, he is an excellent storyteller, and there really doesn't seem to be any limits to what he will talk about and discuss, both during interviews on his own channel, where he just sits there and tells stories, and interviews with other people. Even with this information, the Vlad TV interview that I watched of him on the subject, he said a few things that stuck out. First of all, he said that he fell in love with Keyes before he killed him. He said he learned a lot in the short time that he spent with Keyes and that he did not want to kill him. He also ends the part where he talks about him by saying that he wants to move on and that it upset him to just talk about him. Which stands out because, as I said, Sammy the Bull kind of tends to talk about anything. So the fact that it's a subject that's too sore for him to continue talking about is crazy. Like, to hear him say, like, I don't want to talk about this, it bothers me, it upsets me, it's wild because... He talks about everything. It's also pretty wild to look at pictures of Angelo Bruno dead. He was killed with a shotgun blast to the head in front of his house. And I'm not even putting pictures of this up. Like, it's too graphic. So if you want to go see pictures, you can go Google that. But this is a graphic picture. When all of that was going down, Frank Thierry was the boss of the Genovese family. Tony Salerno would later become the acting boss of the Genovese family, after Funzi Thierry gets sick, he's under the weather. Salerno is the heir apparent to Thierry, and at that point, Thierry, he's about to die. So Salerno, he's about to become boss. So after all of that goes down, Rockman and Angelo, they go to Chicago. They go there to show their support for Jackie Presser as the new Teamsters president. Presser was Rockman's protege, and it would give the Cleveland family some serious street cred to have the president of a Teamsters union on their side. Cerrone and Ayupa in Chicago, they have reservations about Presser. They think that he's an informant. After some back and forth where they were like, we don't want to do it, we think he's a rat, they eventually reluctantly agree to support Presser. Next stop, New York to see Salerno, the big shot. They go to talk to Salerno about Presser, and he doesn't feel great about it either, because once Cerrone and Ayupa are on the fence about it, that makes Salerno on the fence about it. But after some reassurance from Rockman, Salerno gives the nod to Presser as the IBT president. Now, shortly after all of these guys publicly support Presser, an article was released in the Cleveland Plain Dealer claiming that Presser was an informant. Presser goes crazy. He wants a retraction, but the paper refuses. So they all go to New York to meet with Salerno at his 116th Street Club. Angelo laid it out for him, told him that the article is bogus, and asked if Salerno could pull any strings to get this figured out because having it out there in a newspaper that Presser is an informant when he's not is not good for them. Salerno sent Fish Cafaro to ring up Roy Cohn, who had a chat with the paper's owner. Lo and behold, a retraction hit the press shortly after. 
During this visit, Salerno dropped the bomb on these guys that an FBI informant had infiltrated La Cosa Nostra and made his way pretty high up the totem pole. Obviously, this is in reference to Joe Pistone slash Donnie Brasco, so think that's around the time that we're talking about right now. Now, Rockman, he starts to form a pretty good relationship with Salerno directly. He becomes Salerno's go-to guy to deal with the Teamsters since Rockman is so close with Presser. After that relationship formed, Salerno started to ask him for favors, like scoring a union charter and digging up information on a rival vending machine company. They got it done, and this really helped out the relationship between the two families. And again, remember, Salerno is their representative on the commission, so it really matters if these families are close. Now, the Genovese family, they're not only the representatives for Cleveland, they are watching over all of the Eastern crews. Salerno, the boss in the early 80s, has his eyes on things, and Vincent the Chin Gigante is the consigliere, and he is gearing up to take on the seat as boss. Salerno was tight with Benny Lombardo, seeking his wise counsel on family matters. Surprisingly, there was no love lost between the Cleveland family and the Cleveland chapter of the Hells Angels. They did not like each other. Except for one time when Joe Ayakabuchi, a.k.a. Joe Luce, brought in a Hells Angel to help with the hit on Joe Bonarillo, they really hated each other. So that was the only time they ever worked together. And even during that, the Hells Angels didn't find out until after the fact. Bonarillo ended up being killed because of Sunito. Sunito revealed that Bonarillo was plotting against the Cleveland family. So they gave the green light for him to be killed, and they assigned the hit to Ayakabuchi. Turns out, Sunito may have had his own agenda. He was dabbling in the dope scene with Zagaria, and Bonarillo was in the way. After that happened, Big Ange found that Sunito, he may have had his own motives in trying to get Bonarillo taken out. And he wasn't happy about it, but it's not like he, like, ordered a hit on him. But he definitely was pissed, and it, it put a big thorn in the relationship between Big Ange and Sunito. Fast forward to 1981. And they've got David Perrier, a loan shark debt collector for Thomas Sinito. Perrier, with a penchant for drama and bar fights, becomes a pretty big concern for Sinito. Rumor has it that he was talking to authorities. He behaved all kinds of erratically. And one night, Perrier goes off on this tangent and flips out on one of Licavalli's pal, Steve Darby Calcavecchio, at a bar flips out on him in his face, cursing him out, saying nasty shit to him, knowing that this is Likavali's boy. Later on, he would get on his knees and beg forgiveness from Likavali because Likavali was ready to have him killed. So you've got this guy, Perrier. He's causing a ruckus. He's acting erratically. He's doing all kinds of crazy shit. And Sunito, he decides to take matters into his own hands, literally. Now, Angelo is catching up with Sunito daily. But after Perrier bites the dust, he goes MIA for a while. When he finally resurfaces, he drops the bomb that he had actually killed Perrier. The thing is, he hadn't asked for Ange's blessing before he decided to pull the trigger. He didn't ask for permission. He just went out and killed this boy. Sunito and Angelo saw each other pretty regularly because Sunito was a bartender at Big Ange's restaurant, the Highlander Restaurant and Lounge on Northfield Road. This isn't where they met. Sunito had been working alongside the Cleveland family for a really long time, but it's just where they saw each other very regularly. He took care of vending machines. He ran errands for the family. He was a bartender at this club, just the epitome of an associate. According to Sunito, he had a golden opportunity and FOMO kicked in. He spills the details, mentioning Ronnie Anselmo was his partner in crime for this messy business. The murder went down near Warren, Ohio. They picked Perrier up, drove to a quiet spot, and pumped four to five bullets into his head. He goes on about how he and Anselmo popped Perrier a few times in the head, but the guy is still kicking. Perrier screamed to Sunito, you son of a bitch, I thought we were brothers before he died. And what was Sunito's response? I didn't want to miss the chance. To cover their tracks, they dumped the body, torched the blood-soaked car, and call it a day. Now, 
After this happens, Angelo is fuming because Sunito didn't ask for permission. Mob rule number one, always get the boss's blessing before taking someone out. So whatever, Sunito, he's on thin ice. Recently, this man has lied about Bonario, which ended up having him killed. He kills Perrier without any permission, but now at this point, Ange is just like, whatever, like, he doesn't want to lose somebody, he doesn't want to take him out, and obviously, Sanito is willing to put work in if needed, so it's just swept under the rug. Now, later on, a whole bunch of boys are, like, sitting around the clubhouse, all chatting it up, and Gallo, a soldier in Big Ange's crew, starts going on about how Angelo Leonardo is the unsung hero that this community has always needed. Yeah, that's right. He is the mafia's Batman. This guy commands respect from the mob and the feds. But little does he know, Gallo's loose lips would end up causing a lot of trouble later. Because while his intentions are good and his praises are meant to pay homage to somebody that he truly loves, little does he know that every conversation that these guys are having is being recorded. While Gallo is sitting there singing Angelo's praises and talking about he's the boss and how he's the one making the tough calls, he's the best boss ever and blah blah blah, every single word is being recorded and the feds are listening. Now later, Tony Liberatore, a made guy in the Cleveland family, got his hands on an informant list from Cleveland's FBI field office. How? Well, he supposedly promised a woman in the FBI a little something something. So Liberatore goes and gives this list to Jack White, who then shows it to Rockman. Laboratory says that he got it from his FBI connection, and it is now for sale. And guess who gets to foot the bill for this classified information? Their guy, Jack White, hands over the cash, and now the Cleveland family has what they believe is a list of every rat in the country. Or maybe the Cleveland office, at the very least? I'm not really sure. It doesn't really clarify if it's all rats all over America or just all rats in the Cleveland area. This list has some seriously heavy hitters, including their old pal, Danny Green, who apparently was playing both sides. But things are not as simple as they seem. Licavalli and Angelo get together and they start talking and they start to suspect that Liberator is playing dirty. They're thinking that Liberator threw in the names of the people that he just doesn't like not that are genuine rats. And he's hoping that if he adds these names to this list and he gives them a list of real rats, as well as people he doesn't like, everybody on the list will get offed. So what do they do? They turn up the heat in Rockman's incinerator and they burn the list to ashes. Liberator got a stern talking to with strict instructions not to play spy games with the FBI. And they did nothing with the information that they had no idea the legitimacy of. Laborator did not take their advice. He was still cozying up with his FBI buddy. And with this information, he tried to gain power within the family. But the other mob guys saw through it and they were not about to let this boy take over the Cleveland family. Okay, so let's rewind a little bit to the 1970s, when Alan Glick wants a piece of the Las Vegas pie. So he hits up Frank Ballastieri, a Milwaukee family bigwig, for a Teamsters pension fund loan. Glick is eyeing those shiny casinos, the Stardust, the Fremont, and the Desert Inn. Ballastieri, being the go-to guy, hooks up with Nick Sevilla in Kansas City, who promises to find a Cleveland Connect. Cue our man Rockman entering the scene, ready to sweet talk Bill Presser for that pension loan. Now, Glick is no Santa Claus. In exchange for this loan and the ability to get in on this deal, he promises a slice of the casino cake to Milwaukee, Kansas City, and Cleveland. Lefty Rosenthal becomes the Vegas maestro, orchestrating the Skimming Symphony. After the casino cash showers down, Kansas City divides it amongst its crews, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and themselves. Our man Rockman, the cash maestro, takes road trips regularly to Chicago and Kansas City to snag Cleveland's cut. Bill Presser and Roy L. Williams get their piece of the pie, about $1,500 a month. 
And while their pieces may not be that big, Cleveland is laughing all the way to the bank with about $40,000 every month from the skim. Now, of course, when something good happens, it cannot just stay good. Milwaukee and Kansas City start bickering over the skim slices, and that's when Chicago has to step in and play peacemaker. Now, when Angelo was the underboss, the skim is still going on. His cut would sometimes hit $10,000 a month. They would divvy it up amongst the crew, tossing some to Joey Gallo, Tommy Sinito, and Russell Papillardo. Then there's Jack White, Macy Rockman, and yours truly, Big Ange, splitting the rest. After 1977, their skim started to slow down because a lot of it would go straight into Rockman's hands for the legal circus that's surrounding the Danny Green murder. So the mob payday became more of a hit and miss. You know, we talked a lot about John Nardi, but we really never talked about Green. Green is a huge reason that Cleveland got the name Bomb City, since that was the way that he offed people so often. He first got into the underground world when he was hired by the Cleveland Solid Waste Trade Guild. He was hired to keep the peace in negotiations, since the mafia didn't want headlines of killing legit guys based on professional differences. And he did really good at his job. That led to Frank, little Frank Broncato, taking him on to work for him as muscle in the garbage hauling contracts. If it was a job that involved garbage, waste, recycling, whatever, Green was in on it because he was someone who knew how to walk in both worlds, the legitimate and the illegitimate. Before long, Green became a target and ended up killing multiple people who were actively trying to kill him. This man is wild. There's a story about a time that a group of Hell's Angels had started chilling in the area that Green lived in Collinwood. He dealt with it for a little while, but they were really rowdy and noisy, and it started getting on Green's nerves after a while. To handle it, Green walked into the club that they were hanging out at and told them to shut the fuck up. When they ignored him, he grabbed a stick of dynamite that he had brought in with him, telling them that if they didn't shut the fuck up, he would light it inside the bar and stand outside, wait for them to run out, and politely tell them to shut the fuck up outside of the building, where they would surely listen to his warning. It seems like they did just that because I can't find proof that he did light a stick of dynamite inside of a club, which is something that would probably make the news. And knowing the way that Green is, he definitely would have lit that dynamite had they made a peep. So they shut the fuck up. He came back under fire with the mafia in 1975, when he started to try to get into industries that were typically controlled by the mafia. He controlled laundry contracts and started trying to get into vending machines and gambling, which were typically mafia rackets. Thomas, the Chinaman, Sinito, who we've already talked about, and Joey Luce killed a friend of his to try to get their point across to back the fuck off. But Green responded, by wiring Sinito's car to explode. It didn't, Sinito ended up finding the bomb, but the message was clear. I am not scared of you. He took it a step further when he took out a man named John Conti, who was in the vending machine industry and was really close with Joseph Gallo, a Cleveland area mobster. Before he died, there was a shit ton of attempts on his life. His house in Collinwood was blown up in 1975, but he didn't die in the bombing. The bomb was placed in his home after he killed Shondor Burns, a Cleveland area gangster that had put out a hit on Green and then exploded in a car bombing. Once the mafia agreed that Green had to go, they sent Ray Ferrito to do the job. Ferrito stalked Green out for days before making his move. On October 6th, 1977, Green was killed in a taste of your own medicine type scenario. He fell victim to a car bomb in Lindhurst, Ohio. Leonardo became the acting boss in 1981 when James Jack White Licavalli was arrested. He was arrested for the Green murder charge, and he, Carabia, Sister Nino, and three other Cleveland Mafia members were all found guilty of racketeering, conspiracy to murder, murder, and bribery of an FBI agent. Remember when Licavalli told Libertori not to snuggle up to the FBI agent? Well, as I said before, he didn't listen, he continued to do it, and Licavalli would be found guilty of that because this is a RICO trial, 
and anything that anybody in the family does comes down on him. Likavali was sentenced to 17 years in jail, and he died on November 23rd, 1985, of a heart attack at the Federal Correctional Institute in Oxford, Wisconsin. Soon after, Leonardo, Joey Gallo, and a bunch of other Cleveland Mafia members were arrested and looking at spending their golden years behind bars. Tommy Sanito, another Mafia member from the Cleveland family, pulled off a 22-year plea deal in a separate trial. Angelo Leonardo, the mob boss who has spent his entire life keeping tight-lipped, suddenly decides to spill the beans to the feds. Now, at first, he is all about Omerta, refusing to answer any questions, even if they offered him immunity on a silver platter. But reality hit hard at Lewisburg Prison. Denied a judicial appeal and facing some serious time, Angelo picked up that FBI card and dialed them from a prison payphone. He was facing two life sentences, and according to Big Ange, he decided to testify because of the specific charges that were levied against him. In 1984, he was convicted of running a drug ring and sentenced to life in prison. And he still had other trials pending, so he's facing even more than life in prison. Of course, when the news breaks, there's chaos. Family, friends, even past business pals, everyone's upset and scared that Angelo's testimony may just put them behind bars themselves. And just like that, Angelo becomes the VIP of the federal government. They're treating him like royalty because, let's be real here, he's got the deets on all of the mafia's dirty laundry. In the witness chair at 74 years old, looking wrinkled and tired, Angelo spills everything. I told you guys earlier that I had an interview with a Leonardo, and you guys did see some of my interview with Frank Leonardo. He talked to me a little bit about the impact that Ange Flipping had on the rest of the family. Because, I don't know about you, but as for me, I heard Sammy the Bull talk about how his family were brought into a room and he broke the news to them that he was going to become a rat and Karen cried and blah, blah, blah. So when someone informs, you kind of assume that their family already knows beforehand that they're becoming a government informant. Let's listen to Frank Leonardo talk about what happened leading up to Ange going on trial and becoming an informant. <laughs> Did you experience any kind of fallout when Big Ange decided to cooperate with the government? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, especially at the beginning, you have to understand, again, my dad went to law school to defend Big Ange, his uncle. You know, this is my, this is my job. This is my whole reason for being. And we're going to close the office. We're going to focus strictly on this. We're going to keep the office alive out of our own pocket. We're not taking on any clients, one client, one job, one goal to prove his innocence. So all of that is set up. And there's a famous scene of my father on the left, my uncle Ange in the middle, and my Aunt Mary on the right walking into the courtroom, ready to attack. <laughs> and it wasn't until my uncle sat in the courtroom and the uh, prosecution stood up and said, you know, do you, uh, are you going to turn state's evidence? My dad never knew anything about that. Nobody knew anything about that. That was a uh, behind the scenes, backdoor deal that he was looking, my uncle was looking at two consecutive life sentences. You know, my dad and the, the fallout wouldn't have been so if there would have just been honesty up front. Now, his son, his son had a lot of fallout, Big Andrew's son, Big Andrew's son's kids, Joe, uh, Big Andrew's son, Joe, had a lot of fallout with the family. But again, he was himself, and we all took him back in, we're all family, you know. Did but, you guys continue to have a relationship with Big Ange after he cooperated? He went away, we did not. He went away into hiding, so we did not. Oh, so he went into Whitson? He went into Wetsuk shortly. He couldn't take it. I was, okay. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, I don't remember. He went into Wetsuk, you know, shortly. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but had companions come out in Wetsuk. And, um, oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> my audience is very, yeah, very so, older. I, uh, I curse them out all the time, so. <laughs> yeah, so, 
it wasn't until he was sick and came back here that I ran into him, and he was about 96 years old, you know, or 91 at the time. But uh, other than that, my grandfather passed away. He came to the funeral, but my dad wouldn't let us in when he was there. So the only time he could see his brother is before the wake started. I mean, we knew he was there, but again, at the same time, to us at that time, he hurt my dad. So, as horrible as it is to say, we're putting up a little wall. As, uh, as unfair as that is, we put up a little wall, but at the end of the day, we're all family, we're all here for each other. And, and, and my dad even sat down with him years after the fact, looked right at him and said, you killed your brother by what you did. Told Big Ends, you killed your brother by what you did. And he's like, I, I, I love my brother, I would do anything for my family. I, 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 I wasn't gonna do two life sentences. You know? And all you gotta do is tell me, my dad said. You told me, I, 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 I would've talked to you, we would've came up with the best plan, and we would've moved forward. They cried, they hugged, they kissed, and you know, and uh, it was a nice moment after years. And so that was his only reason for cooperating, was that he didn't want to do such a long sentence? No, no, they wanted him to, you know, they wanted, well, he had two consecutive life sentences he was looking at, followed by um, additional charges, additional evidence that they had where it would implicate, you know, so it, which angle are you taking? Are you going to get on a stand, and are you going, I'm not going to, Big Ange is like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to rat on anybody, but I'm going to tell you certain things. I'm going to tell you certain things. So it's going to be conceived as ratting, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to get what I want, and I'm not going to spend one night in jail. So do you have any idea what the fallout from Big Ange's uh, testimony was? Like, Do you know how many people ended up in jail based on his testimony or anything like that? Quite a few, uh, definitely quite a few. Uh, you know, at that point, we were more heartbroken and disgusted. And it's like it's like when you watch a movie and, and you have the the good music, the fast pace, everything is going great. This movie is spectacular. And then it gets to that dark side of the movie where the truth comes in, the downhill spiral comes in, and these are surrounding, and the star of the show is getting killed. It's like Henry Hill. And Henry the, uh, Hill. Oh, believe me, that's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly it. And that's why, as great of a movie as Goodfellas is, <laughs> it hits. It hits a little bit because we lived it. Yeah. You know, so it's it's hard. And, and again, it's a spectacular movie. And Henry Hill. Is, I've heard interviews with Henry Hill, and he went through a very similar thing. Mm -hmm. He went uh, where he couldn't take Woodstock anymore. I'm losing my mind over here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't do know it. very many people that stay in no. Woodstock forever. Um, I mean, Sammy the Bull, as much as I kind of dislike him, I thought he was a boss for what he did. He was in Woodstock. Um, he had plastic surgery to change his yeah. face. And then he went to Arizona in Woodstock and got tired of it. So he started going on a radio station. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, come get me if you want. Come get me. <laughs> yeah. And exactly. And even with uh, my Uncle Ange, at one point it came to a time where he was... Once he got to 80, 80 years old, I can't do this, you know. If, if someone's going to come get me, come get me. Yeah. You know, so uh, it was, I understand that with Sammy the Bull. And, and, and there's uh, very similar stories with, with uh, Sammy the Bull and his good sack and, and even Henry Hill. Yeah. Now, this entire episode has been based on some of Angelo's testimony, but while we have that, I do want to read off a little bit of what the lawyers and senators were talking about and saying at the trials that Angelo was being questioned at. When opening up questioning to Angelo, Senator Roth made a statement, and I think it's important to hear this statement. Even though it's from all the way back in the mid-80s, it's something that's relevant today, and it showcases where things may have gone wrong. Senator Roth says, On Monday, we were told we are facing a new generation 
of the La Cosa Nostra, which differs significantly from their predecessors. They lack respect for tradition and for the family. They have succumbed to the influence of drugs, both as traffickers and users. As a result, they have become more greedy, selfish, and more violent. Many have chosen to forsake Omerta, the traditional vow of silence, and turn in other family members to save their own skins. He goes on to say, On Monday, Tommaso Buscetta, a former Sicilian La Cosa Nostra member, told us that these changes are not limited to the United States. Primarily because of drugs, he said, in Italy as well, there are no more men of honor. I don't know, that just struck a chord with me. I wanted to read it off to you guys, because maybe that does show why the mafia is where it is now. Why every other guy is a rat nowadays. It's so prevalent. Obviously, that has a huge part of the sentences coming down. They're no longer being sentenced to five to ten years. They're getting life every time. And that's why a lot of these guys decide to inform. But this also might have something to do with it as well. In Kansas City, mobsters' face turned pale as they were hit with guilty verdicts. We're talking about the big shots. Joseph Ayupa, the boss of the Chicago Mafia at 78 years old. Frank Bellistieri from Milwaukee. And a bunch more of the Mafia members. These guys were accused of swiping nearly $2 million from Vegas casinos. Some pled guilty, but Leonardo testified against everyone who didn't. In the Las Vegas skimming trial in Kansas City, Angelo's deep knowledge of the underworld and their connection to the gambling in Vegas is shown off. This is why it's such a big deal that Angelo is the second highest ranking mobster to ever turn government informant up until that point. The higher the rank, the more knowledge they have on the inner workings of the mafia and the people in it, and the more damage they can do to the organization. In 1980, the feds in New York launched Operation Take Down the Mob, also known as the Commission Trial. They're on a mission against the mafia, and Leonardo testified in the trial that would cripple the mafia, taking down the leadership of all five families. Angelo testified before the United States Senate on April 15, 1988. On the Senate floor, he testified about the skimming in Vegas surrounding the Cleveland family and the rest of the Midwest Mafia. In 1986, he took the stand as the star witness at the United States v. Salerno trial. He testified about how the upper echelon of the Cleveland family would frequently travel to New York to meet with Salerno to have decisions made by him, and how he represented the Cleveland family plus the rest of the Midwest on the commission. In all of these trials, as he testified, he did it hidden behind a screen so his face was shielded. He wrote a statement for each trial that he would read off before he testified, where he laid out everything that he had ever done pertaining to each trial. Before Sammy the Bull Gravano flips and becomes a witness in the 1990s, Leonardo and Jimmy Fratiano, the acting boss in Los Angeles, are the two highest ranking mafia members to ever flip in La Cosa Nostra. Ironically, Fratiano, the second highest witness, was the star witness in the case that put Licavalli away for the rest of his life. Angela was the first ever sitting boss to testify. After serving an 18-month prison sentence, Angelo entered the witness protection program. He quit the program shortly after, returning to Ohio and even taking part in the Sugar Wars documentary. In his final act, Angelo Big Ange Leonardo passed away in his sleep peacefully on March 31st, 2006 at the ripe old age of 95 years old. His farewell went down at St. Dominic Church, and he was buried at Cavalry Cemetery in Ohio. When Ange was arrested for drugs, the claim is that what changed between the conviction when he was 19 years old for murder of Sam Todaro, where he got life and kept quiet, and this one, where he was on trial, hadn't even been convicted fully yet, but decided to rat, was twofold according to him, according to family according to everybody else. Honestly, I'm going to interject right here, right now. I personally think he would have ratted back then. I think he got sentenced. He was only a year into his sentence. He was still very much hopeful that he would get out. But I fully believe that had he had the chance to spend a long time in prison, he would have become a witness. This boy did not have the stomach for sitting in jail. And that is shown by the fact that he testified at 77 years old. 
Reason number one was the conviction itself. Ange would vehemently deny until his dying breath that he would ever have anything to do with dealing drugs and that he never, under any circumstances, actually gave permission or ever would give permission to his crew to go out and sell drugs. And that's what he was convicted of, okaying his guys to go out and sell drugs and taking a percentage of the profits. And he says, I just didn't do that and I'm not going to jail for it. Two, that there was rats that were flipping on him. Far from all, but there was a good amount of people who had flipped on him and were testifying against him, saying that he had given permission to sell drugs and that he knew he was taking money from the profits of selling drugs, knowing that a percentage of the money that he made on the streets was made from selling drugs. So he felt like La Cosa Nostra had turned on him, which made him, in turn, turn around and become a witness and turn on them. When he went to jail when he was 19 years old, he had actually done the crime and at least deserved to be in jail for what he was in jail for. But in this case, according to him, he had done absolutely nothing to deserve, earn, or warrant this sentence. And if there was multiple people flipping on him, he wasn't about to spend the rest of his life on a drug charge for a bunch of people who were ratting and lying about him. I understand what he's saying. I do. But at the end of the day, I hate to say it, a rat is a rat is a rat. It's a shame that Angelo lived such a long life as a La Cosa Nostra member with such a stellar record and would be remembered to this day as one of the greatest mafia members to ever live had he not made that decision. I find it absolutely wild that he testified instead of just eating that sentence at 77 years old, the end of his life. But I don't know, man, to each his own, I guess. <laughs> it's just a shame. Like what a legacy this boy would have left behind had he not succumbed to the government. Okay, I am finally, finally after five parts, finally done with Angelo Big Ange Leonardo. The end. If you've stuck in here for all of these episodes, thank you so much, and I really hope you enjoyed this series. Thanks so much for watching. Join me next week as I delve into the lives and legacies of some of the most fascinating and infamous gangsters in history. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, comment, follow, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye!